Warning, Kinda Murdery contains adult themes, explicit language, and descriptions of violence. It is not suitable for anyone, and we recommend you stop listening now. Hello everyone, and welcome to Kinda Murdery, a true crime podcast that's mostly about murder, and always about the strange and compelling stories that arise when the path less traveled twists to darkness and those who walk its shadows surrender to violence and corruption. I'm your host, Zevin Odelberg. We have a perilous journey ahead, so thank you for lending me your courage and good company. In Serbia, the 12 holy days of Christmas, that's the 12 days between the birth of Christ and the arrival of the wise men on January 6th, otherwise known as the Epiphany. In Serbia, those 12 holy days are referred to as unbaptized days, and during this time, ghosts and demons run rampant. The Karakonkolos, or Christmas Sasquatch, among them. In honor of the holidays, I thought I'd take a little break from telling bone-chilling, hair-raising, hateful homicide stories and instead bring you a side of the Christmas season you may not have heard before, the kind of murdery side. And, to that end, today, I present to you Kinda Murdery's Christmas Cryptids, or The Devil Sasquatch and Six Other Kinda Murdery Christmas Cryptids. Oh, I'd like to mention that a number of articles were very useful in putting this episode together and that you can find my sources, as always, in the show notes. Today's show features many different mythical beasts of the Yuletide season, including the Christmas Cannibal Scarecrow from the Franco-German border, from Eastern Europe, the just-referred-to Christmas Sasquatch, from Greece, the Christmas Apocalypse Goblins, and several others. Seven in total. As I was rounding up the kind of murdery Christmas cryptids, one thing became abundantly clear. Pretty much only in the United States, and to a lesser extent Great Britain, is Christmas just about joy, rather than joy balanced by fear and severe punishment. You see, in the U.S., jolly old St. Nick's sidekicks are his elves who, as far as our children are told, are really just benevolent helpers who put together the presents and make sure the sleigh stays on course. The worst thing that ever happens to a naughty child in the U.S. is to find a lump of coal in their stocking instead of treats, and even coal is at least useful to keep you warm on cold winter nights. But head over to Europe, from east to west, and you'll find a whole host of Christmas cryptids. You see, when it comes to Christmas, Europe is big on the whole good cop bad cop thing. Here comes Santa Claus, or equivalent, with gifts for good little children, but Santa is often, if not usually, accompanied by a horrifying enforcer, who is much more likely to viciously beat or even horribly murder and possibly eat those who are naughty and don't follow the rules. I imagine many of you are at least a little familiar with Krampus, the Austrian hairy-horned demon monster who accompanies Santa Claus, shoves naughty children into his wicker child basket, and allegedly drags them straight to hell. So, I'm not going to cover Krampus, although I guess I just did, but I think you'll be amazed how many variations on St. Nick's brutal thug exist. In fact, in Eastern Europe in particular, the 12 days of Christmas are much closer to being a violent, real-life Halloween, a time when the veil between worlds thins and demons walk the earth. Those 12 days are much closer to that than they are to a time that's simply for festivities and joy. And if that sounds strange to you, and you're ready to find out more, then I suggest that you put your personal items underneath the seat in front of you, stow your carry-on in the overhead compartment, let go of the worries of the day, but make sure your seatbelt is fastened. There's turbulence expected ahead. Kind of Murderies, The Devil Sasquatch, and Six Other Kind of Murdery Christmas Cryptids starts now. Number 7. The Calicantazaroi, or Christmas Apocalypse Goblins. The second name I give, by the way, is my personal translation of what these things are. The name, though, is the Calicantazaroi, and hopefully anyone who knows how to pronounce any of these names correctly will forgive me if my pronunciation is off, And then the translation I give is my personal take on exactly what this particular Christmas cryptid is. 
I just didn't want you to think that any of these were the official translation. They're the kind of murdery Zevin's goofy mind translation. And so again, the Calacantazaroi are the Christmas apocalypse goblins, and you're about to find out why. They're from Greece. And in Greece, a group of demons called the Calacantazaroi was said to spend the year underground sawing through the tree of life that ran through the earth. So that's why I called them apocalypse goblins, because I imagine if one were to cut down the tree of life, that would have fairly doomsdayish implications. So that's what they do. They spend the year underground sawing through the tree of life that runs through the earth. And then each December, when just one single thread holds the tree together, the 12 days of Christmas compel them to come overground and wander the earth. By the time they return in January, the tree's repaired itself and the goblins have to start all over again. Honestly, that's why they're number seven on the list. This Sisyphusian labor doomed to fail, no matter how evil or murdery they are, made me feel kind of bad for them. But let's talk about what they get up to when they're overground. What they get up to is mischief and chaos. And above all, they seek to steal any child born over the 12 days of Christmas and turn them into fellow Calacantazaroi. However, these Christmas apocalypse goblins can be kept at bay by binding newborn babies in straw and garlic. You can also stop them from getting into your house by placing a colander outside the door. That's one of those round metal bowls with the holes in it that you use to rinse vegetables and the like. You see, when a Christmas apocalypse goblin encounters a colander, presumably on your stoop outside your door, they are compelled to count the holes in the colander. But because the number three is holy in Greek, they will fail to count that number and have to start again, and this will occupy them until sunrise, when the house will be safe until darkness falls again. So yeah, between almost cutting down the tree and then being compelled above ground by the 12 days of Christmas, and then getting stuck counting colander holes over and over until dawn, these poor guys just can't catch a break. And that is why I have put the Calacantazaroi, or Christmas Apocalypse Goblins, which sounds terrible, at number seven. These guys just can't get it done. Let's move on to number six. Bell Snickle, or Kris Kringle, the cross-dressing Christmas kid switcher, Germany, and the U.S., specifically Pennsylvania. That's right. I didn't just say Bell Snickle, I said Kris Kringle, and I bet ya Santa's not too thrilled with the confusion because Bell Snickle, or Kris Kringle, is most definitely not Santa. Like his Austrian Alpine cousin Krampus, Bell Snickle is another Germanic child-whipping character that's taken root in Pennsylvania. Masked and dressed in tattered clothes and furs, very much like Krampus, Bellsnickel visits children in the early days of December. He comes equipped with a sack of sweets and a whip. However, Bellsnickel's aim isn't to punish the naughty and reward the good, but to persuade all children to mend their behavior. Bellsnickel's name matches his dual purpose. It comes from the German for a smack, suffixed with nickel for St. Nicholas. This is because, unlike many of his other European counterparts, Bell Snickle combines the benign gift-giving aspect of St. Nicholas with a more feral, festive presence. Originally a native of the Rhineland, Bell Snickle accompanied German immigrants to Pennsylvania in the early 19th century. The Bell Snickle tradition began to be recorded soon afterwards. On December 5th, just before St. Nicholas Day, groups of young men were observed dressing up in skins and furs to celebrate Bell Snickle Night. They roamed the streets of their settlements, rattling chains and bells and acting boisterously in imitation of the rites of Krampus. Elsewhere, Bellsnickel himself was at large. Jacob Brown of Maryland described a visit from Bellsnickel sometime around 1830. Brown's Bellsnickel was also called Chris Kringle, or Chris Kinkle, and sometimes even the Christmas woman because he often dressed in women's clothes. He made his appearance one or two weeks before Christmas. The figure of Bellsnickel was probably undertaken by the father of the house, who had previously absented himself under the pretense of work. Or perhaps, Bellsnickel is just a real Christmas cryptid out there wandering the streets, waiting to whip your kids and give them candy. And boy, yes, that does sound kind of murdery. But according to Jacob Brown, sometime after dark, a mysterious figure in a long robe and hood arrived, bearing a sack crammed with goodies, cakes, fruit and nuts, and a long hazel stick. This character would rap on the window of the house and ask for admittance. 
The children of the house would only let him in if he answered a question or sang them a song. However, once inside, Bell Snickle would scatter the contents of his sack, and the children would dive in to collect the goodies. As the children fell upon the sweet treats, Bell Snickle roamed amongst them, switching them on their backs. The beating came to be seen as a warning toward good behavior, but like so many other Christmas switchings, Bell Snickle's beatings had an earlier significance. Like the whippings of Krampus, it was initially administered as a good luck charm for the children's well-being. Spare the rod, spoil the child, I suppose? All right. Number five, Frau Percha, the Alpine Eviscerator, or Belly Slitten Grandma, Austria, and parts of Germany and Italy. In pre-Christian traditions, Percha was an Alpine goddess whose particular celebration day coincided with the Twelfth Night. After pre-Christian traditions were displaced, she instead became a demonic witch who stalked villages, punishing anyone who dared to displease her. If you angered her, she would appear as a demonic horned monster. Sometimes she appeared as a mischievous, disheveled old woman. Alternatively, her appearance could depend on how you perceived her and whether you had pleased her. If you were faithful, obedient, and observed her rituals, Percha would appear to you as a woman of divine beauty. If you angered her, she would appear as a demonic horned monster with a ferocious bloodlust. Percha would let you be as long as you followed her rituals on Percha's night, such as eating a traditional meal, and you baked special cakes in her honor. Should you fail to do that, she would sneak into your room whilst you slept, slit your belly open, and replace your innards with pebbles and straw. The following day, whoever discovered your corpse would assume you'd simply died in your sleep. Unless, of course, they performed an autopsy and discovered that your guts were now pebbles and straw. Speaking of straw... That brings us to number four, Hans Trapp, the Christmas Cannibal Scarecrow, France. This legend is well known in the French regions of Alsace and Lorraine. The story of Hans Trapp, or the Christmas Cannibal Scarecrow, is a lesson to be learned in what happens when you stray from God, turn to the devil, and become obsessed with wealth and power. Trapp lived in the 1400s and was very rich and powerful, but he was also merciless and feared by the people who lived in Alsace. He became obsessed with power and dominating his fellow man, and he made deals with the devil to achieve his nefarious ends. In other words, he sold his soul to Satan. The Catholic Church and the Pope found out about it, and they excommunicated him. As a result, he was shunned from his community, banished, stripped of his titles, lands, and money. Hans had to resort to living in the mountains of Bavaria, Germany, where he dedicated himself to practicing black magic and the occult. He ended up losing his mind from isolation and went from obsessing over power to wanting revenge on those who had wronged him. During this time, he also developed a hankering for human flesh. One day, Hans Trapp stuffed his clothing with straw and disguised himself as a scarecrow and placed himself along the road. A ten-year-old boy from the village walked by and Hans grabbed him and stabbed him and took the boy's body back to his lair where he sliced him into tiny pieces and cooked his flesh. But before Hans could feast, God, fed up with his evil doing, struck him down with a divine lightning bolt. Depending on which story you read, Hans either dies instantly or hits his head on a rock when he falls and then dies. Now, not to second guess the Lord, but boy, it would have been awesome if that lightning bolt had arrived before the child was killed. I mean... I feel like child murder should have been the straw that broke the camel's back, but apparently it was cannibalism that was a bridge too far. Oh well. Now here's where the story takes a turn. You see, that divine lightning bolt was not the end of Hans' trap. He continued to roam the earth dressed as a scarecrow. And, like Krampus, Trap teamed up with St. Nicholas, but he did it to earn redemption. While St. Nicholas awarded presents to the virtuous, Trap tries to persuade naughty children to mend their ways and be virtuous. So he is a bit like a cannibal scarecrow version of Krampus. However, unlike Krampus, Hans Trap has his origins in a real historical person. Hans von Troth, a two-meter high, late 15th century German knight with a terrible reputation. Von Troth had lands and castles on the German side of the border with France and was a thorough nuisance to church and state alike. In fact, Hans von Troth was the real-life inspiration for the mythical archetype of the Black Knight. I'll buy you later! And that was the Black Knight from Monty Python's Quest for the Holy Grail. If you haven't seen it, or 
if you haven't heard of it, my gosh, I love that movie so much I've lost count of the number of times that I've seen it, and mentioning it here on Kinda Murdery is my Christmas gift to you, that's Monty Python and the Quest for the Holy Grail, which features the most memorable Black Knight of all time, even beyond the inspiration for all Black Knights, Mr. Hans von Troth, who was apparently six foot five. But let's get back to his story. Von Troth was involved in a land dispute with a local abbot. As part of the feud, he ordered the Weislauter River blocked, depriving the nearby town of Weissenberg of its water supply. When the abbot complained, Von Troth petulantly tore down the dam, flooding Weissenberg and destroying its economy. In 1491, Von Troth even managed to get himself excommunicated after the same abbot complained about him to the Pope. Von Troth not only insolently refused to go to Rome to give an account of his behavior, but he sent a letter in which he proclaimed his own faith and virtue and accused the Pope of all manner of heinous sins and vile acts, about which I won't be speculating on this Christmas-themed episode of Kinda Murdery. Suffice to say that Von Troth's sinister appearance, destructive behavior, and excommunication from the church all became mixed up in myth, and after his death led to the creation of Hans Trap, a warning to children on how not to live their lives. However, the end of the real Hans Trap was no gruesome mystery, for Hans von Troth died quietly, at home, of natural causes, in his castle at Bergwardstein. Number 3. Lucy, the hideous tyrannical demon of light. Norway and Sweden. In Norway and Sweden, December 13th is Santa Lucia's Day. Santa Lucia is represented as a beautiful young woman, and nowadays the occasion is marked by a young woman in a white gown or white sash representing the saint roaming the streets with a crown of candles on her head. Full disclosure, Odelberg is a Swedish name, and as a child I celebrated Santa Lucia's Day. We would go over to our fully Swedish friend's house and stay up all night. And then, after midnight, the girls would come in in white gowns with crowns of candles on their heads and serve us special cakes. That's how the holiday is celebrated in modern times. However, a few centuries ago, Norway celebrated Lucia, or Lucy, in a very different form. For the night before December 13th, Lucy's night, was the night when evil spirits and demons rose up to wander the earth. Children needed to be good, and the adults warded off evil by protecting their homes with the sign of the cross. Lucy was portrayed as a hideous demon with tyrannical powers. She rode through the skies on a broomstick accompanied by demons, evil spirits, and trolls, spreading mayhem and chaos, destroying property, crops, and livestock, and kidnapping or killing anyone foolish enough to not be tucked up safely in bed. The night between the 12th and 13th of December has held a special place in Viking Age and medieval Scandinavia. Our pre-Christian sources to this celebration are scarce, and we can only rely on folklore that survived until the present day, and that we know was practiced at least through the 13th century, its attributes clearly stemming from far earlier pagan times. This is the night when the month of Yule began, and it was also the most dangerous night of the year, when Lucy, a female spirit, a vet, ruled the night. She was the mother and or queen of the vetter, the spirits, and other huldrefolk, otherworldly beings. Again, I may be mispronouncing something, forgive me. As such, she was kin to Huldra, gnomes, trolls, and at some time in history, even to the gods, hence her relation to the Asgard Rai, the riders of Asgard, who in some traditions appeared on this night as well, while in other traditions they're called the Euleria, the Yule Riders, known in other parts of the world as the Wild Hunt. Scandinavian fairies is what we're talking about here. People had to stay inside, eating and celebrating to placate and avert the anger of Lucy's retinue, and keeping the lights on. It was also very important to take care of the animals. This was the night of the year in which the animals would talk to each other and let pass their verdicts on how their humans treated them, and woe to the people who did not treat their animals well. Vengeance would then come from Lucy and her retinue of dark winter spirits. So, the barn and the stable had to be clean and comfy for the beasts, and they would be bribed with particularly good food on this night, in the hopes that they would give a favorable report to Lucy. The animals would discuss all the year's events and pass on all the gossip they had witnessed. As soon as the Scandinavian countries became Christian, Lucy's long night became the celebration of a Roman saint, Lucia, also meaning light. The celebration would take the form of a procession led by a young maiden carrying a crown with four candles singing Santa Lucia. She symbolizes the bringer of light in the dark. 
To what degree this celebration took a new form or is directly copied from pagan ritual processions is not known, but it is widespread, particularly in Scandinavia and in Italy and in the Nordic Primstav, a wooden runic calendar, where Lucia's celebration was always marked. Number two, La Père Fautard, Father Whipper, France and Belgium. Le Père Fautard is a French-Belgian Christmas boogeyman who, like the cannibal scarecrow, has one foot in history and the other in the pagan past, and also, like Krampus, is linked to the purifying, punishing aspect of whipping, hence his name, Father Whipper. That's not a boogeyman who whips fathers, but rather Father Whipper, as opposed to, say, Father Christmas. Dressed in dark robes with a sooty face and unkempt hair and beard, Children can hear Le Père Fautard coming from the sound of the slapping of his whip. Le Père does not work alone. He also follows St. Nicholas from house to house, acting as his punisher, dispensing coal and beatings to the naughty. His original pagan context is lost, so instead he is given shape by various more historical legends and events. The most popular story of Le Père Fautard dates from around 1150. In this tale, Le Père was either an innkeeper or a butcher with particularly evil habits. One day, he and his wife captured three boys on their way to a religious boarding school. They robbed the boys of their money and then disposed of them most gruesomely, slitting their throats, cutting them up, and stewing them. St. Nicholas heard of the crime and resurrected the children. On seeing this miracle, the evil innkeeper repented. He either volunteered to help St. Nicholas as a penance, or else was forced by the saint to assist him every Christmas, punishing the bad, while the saint rewarded the good. Other more historically verifiable events explain Le Père's dirty face. In 1552, the northeastern French city of Metz was under siege by the forces of Charles V, the Spanish king and Holy Roman Emperor. The anger of the citizens led them to make a likeness of the emperor and drag it through the city streets and burn it. At the same time, the tanners of Metz had created a grotesque character who punishes children. The two separate effigies somehow married themselves together in the popular mind and became incorporated into the role of Le Père Fautard, Father Whipper. Number 1. The Karakonkolos, or Christmas Bigfoot, Bulgaria, Turkey, and Serbia. I also referred to this in the title of the show as the Devil Sasquatch. And this is probably the one that cryptid fans have truly been waiting for. The Karen Kolos is generally portrayed as a cross, as I just said, between the devil and a Sasquatch. According to late Ottoman Turkish myths, the Karen Kolos appears on the street corner between December 22nd and January 2nd, so he's a Christmas and a New Year's monster. In Turkey, the Karen Kolos would stand on street corners on winter nights, setting riddles for passers-by. If the traveler gave him an answer that included the word black, they were free to go on their way. If not, he would strike them dead with a single blow. Elsewhere, the Karen Kolo's favorite trick was to disguise his voice to pretend to be someone's friend or relative and lure the intended victim out into the snow. Sometimes the creature would set them in a trance and leave them to roam free, but in Serbia, the Karen Kolo's preferred to jump on the victim's back and use them as a personal taxi service. The exhausted person was only released at dawn. If you invited a Karen Kolos into your house, they would feel compelled to imitate their host's behavior. So, if you set fire to a silk or thread, the Karen Kolos would be tricked into setting fire to its own fur and would run from the house screaming to find water. In Bulgaria, the Karen Kolos is said to wander at night, but you can scare it away by avoiding eye contact. Don't look at it, and it won't bother you. Also in Bulgaria, the tradition of kukiri has sprung up specifically to keep the Karen Kolos at bay. According to this tradition, people dress up in body costumes and bells and frolic through the streets at night to scare away evil spirits, such as the Christmas Bigfoot, that's right, the devil Sasquatch, Karen Kolos. All of this happens in conjunction with the first ten days of Zemheri, the dreadful cold. The Karen Kolos can be found in legends across Turkey, Bulgaria, Serbia, and Macedonia. While each country has a varying story, its description remains relatively the same in that Karen Kolos is a tall, hairy creature described as a cross between Satan and a Sasquatch. It seems like every part of the world has its own cryptid ape tradition, from the Yeti of the Himalayas to the Skunk Ape of the American South. But as far as I know, the Karen Kolos is the only example of a Bigfoot prankster, much less one that goes out of its way to interact with humans. The classic cryptid ape 
is painfully shy and lives in an inaccessible area, like the mountains of the Pacific Northwest. I myself am from Bigfoot country, up in Humboldt County. Or they live somewhere like the swamps of the Deep South. And there's usually a smell attached to the legend. After all, that's where Skunk Ape gets his name. And yet, I find no mention of Karen Kolos being a stinky fellow. So there you have it. That's number one on Kinda Murdery's list of seven Christmas cryptids. Karen Kolos, the Christmas Bigfoot of Eastern Europe. Now before I go, I want to wish you all a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. I suppose I'll be back before Christmas, but don't be surprised if there's another Christmas-themed episode. I also want to take a moment to acknowledge that the holidays are a difficult time for many of us. To that end, I want to remind you that the Kind of Murdery community is here to support you. Please don't hesitate to reach out to me, kindamurdery at gmail.com, to share your stories, your thoughts, your feelings, or whatever you want to. And also, please do remember the three-digit lifeline number 988 that you can call to receive immediate counseling for substance use, mental health, or suicidal thoughts. So if you find yourself in acute crisis, please do call 988. Program it into your phone now. If you're not in acute crisis, but you've just got the holiday blues and you'd like to connect with someone or you have a story you'd like to share, if you're a disabled person or someone whose life is challenged in another way, again, please don't hesitate to reach out to me, kindamurdery at gmail.com. I'm here, I care, and I would love to connect with you. And always, always, always remember, the world is a better place with you in it. All right. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah, Happy New Year, Happy Holidays, Happy, Happy Festival Season, everyone. I will see you again on Sunday. I'm Zevin Odelberg, and this has been Kinda Murdery. 